anytime we take on something that requires us to adapt, to stretch, to grow, we will feel stressed by it. In this episode, I'm talking with Lisa Damore, New York Times bestselling author of Untangled, guiding teenage girls through the seven transitions into adulthood. In this episode, we're talking about her new book, Under Pressure, Confronting the Epidemic of Stress and Anxiety in Girls. Lisa shares some encouraging insights about reframing how we think about stress and anxiety in ourselves and in our daughters. She also shares ways we can help ease our girls' anxiety levels at home, in their social lives, and at school. Hello and welcome to the Sunshine Parenting Podcast, where each week we talk about ideas for raising kids who become thriving adults. I'm your host, Audrey Monkey. I'm a summer camp director, writer, and speaker, and I've had the privilege of working with thousands of children, teenagers, young adult counselors, and parents over the past three decades. My husband, Steve, and I are raising five kids who currently range in age from 15 to 25. So my interest in raising kind, optimistic, self-reliant kids who become thriving adults is personal as well as professional. So I'm really happy to welcome Dr. Lisa Demore on the podcast today. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, thank you. I know you're in a really busy time with your just talking to lots of people and you do so much. So why don't you talk a little bit about your background and the different places where you're working with girls and learning about what's going on with them? Sure. So I'm a clinical psychologist. And so everything I do, you know, sort of with that hat on. I have a very small private practice that I've maintained because I really do value the close and focused work that private practice allows. And then I consult two days a week to Laurel School. I live in Shaker Heights, Ohio, and Laurel's an all-girls school where I've consulted for 15 years. So I've been there a long time. And then I write quite a bit. I, um, I write a monthly column for the New York Times about teenagers. It's called Adolescence. And I just finished up this book. And at some point, I think I'm expected to write another one. So I'll figure out that. I also am a regular contributor at CBS News. So probably on average, about once a month, I go to New York for their morning show and cover topics related to teenagers or children or sort of broader psychological topics for them. So that's um, sort of a, a, a sense of what I do um, with my time. All of it are just different ways to try to make sense of and understand and talk and think about teenagers and teenage girls in particular. Well, you, you obviously, you have a great way of synthesizing the information. And I think that's why people find your book so helpful is this, that you have taken kind of all this deep, heavy stuff about what's going on and really kind of put it down to very simple to understand terms for those of us who work with girls or have daughters. One question I had as I was reading, did you start all your work with girls before you had your own daughters or was it kind of a simultaneous thing? I did. I actually, I got my PhD when I was 26 years old. And so I had been practicing for, I didn't have my older daughter until I was 34. So, you know, in terms of all the training you do before you get your PhD and then, you know, I practicing, I, it had been at least 10 years that I was working before I myself was a parent, which is, you know, not, not ideal really in some ways because, you know, how you practice and how you talk and think about, you know, parenting does change when you have actually (laughs) woken to a vomiting child at 2 a.m. your own self. Right. Yeah, I, I always think about the same thing with camp. Like, you know, I, I was similar. I was doing, I was running camp and working with all these kids and training the counselors before I had my own kids. And I remember thinking after I had kids, like, wow, this is like a lot harder than the way I tell people right. what to do. <laughs> I'd like to take some of that back now. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, um, it's way so. easier to, to uh, learn about. And also another thing, and I don't know if you found this, but other people's children respond better to me and my counsel than my own kids. I don't know if you see that at all. Like just how like other people and other parents are like, oh, you know, my kids, like they listen to you because you're their <laughs> director. And I'm like, well, that's great because half the time at my own house, I can't get my own kids to listen. Certainly in my own house, my own kids don't listen to me. And I don't even try to wear my psychologist hat home. 
I think that's actually a real um, hazard that sometimes psychologists can fall into. And so luckily, I learned that early in my training, you know, just be mom at home. And every once in a while, my daughters will say, mom, like, be a psychologist for a minute, you know, and so then I'll, I'll try to slip into it for a minute, but I try not to hang out there. That's really good. And I'm sure your girls are so attuned and can tell when you're, you know, when you're kind of going into that mode versus not. Because as you say in the book, girls are incredibly attuned to what we're feeling, even if we're trying to hide it. Our kids know us better than we know ourselves. Yep, I think, absolutely. And I think boys too. Okay, well, let's talk about your book, Under Pressure. It is really good. And it's funny, I have to say, it's not what I was really expecting. It's so much better. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and I think one of the reasons that I feel like it's better is that I think a lot of times, you know, parents are feeling stressed themselves about what to do and how to parent. And I think what your book provides is a sense of relief and encouragement that, you know, there's these things going on. And yes, you know, anxiety is a, a big issue. However, there's all these things that we can do in different areas to relieve some of that. I want you to start first to share a little bit about just sort of that overview piece that you talk about in chapter one, about kind of reframing for parents, how we think about stress and anxiety, and realizing that it's not all bad. So if you could just explain that, that would be great. Sure. Now this, I would say, for me, chapter one is one big giant public service announcement coming from the clinical and research side of psychology, hopefully out to as many families as who read. The bottom line is psychologists understand and have long understood that stress and anxiety are both normal and healthy functions. They both can reach troublesome degrees. And even when we do, they do, we're really good at treating them. But stress and anxiety are part of life. So stress is what happens when we operate at the edge of our capacities. Anytime we take on something that requires us to adapt, to stretch, to grow, we will feel stressed by it. And that can be getting our dream job or moving to a new house that we really wanted or welcoming a baby into the home. You know, all of those things are very stressful, but we don't see that as bad. Anxiety is a normal system that keeps us safe. It's an alarm that alerts us to pay attention, to notice what's on, going on around us or going on inside of us. So, you know, when we're driving and we can see in our rearview mirror that somebody's coming up behind us very quickly, we get anxious and that's a good thing because the discomfort of anxiety makes us pay attention. And then we watch that driver or we switch lanes or something like that. When we are messing around on Facebook, when we're supposed to be getting ready for a meeting, you know, eventually we get kind of anxious because we're not mm -hmm. doing the right thing. And that gets us to stop doing mm -hmm. something we're not supposed to do. So anxiety and stress are not only normal, they're actually beneficial. Mm -hmm. Stress builds capacity. When we operate at our, at our outer edge, usually our edge grows, right? We, we develop new abilities we didn't know we had. Having a second baby is not nearly the same big deal it is as having a first baby come into the house, even though you now have twice as many kids. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, anxiety is largely a protective function. I would not get rid of anxiety if I could. It's part of what keeps us safe. Right. And I mean, it just even, I have to say, just even listening to you say that and reading chapter one, we're really, I just kept having all these aha moments that a lot of times when you hear parents talking about their worries about their kids or especially their girls, they think it's un, like, they think any stress or anxiety is bad. And I love the way you're making it very clear that all of us have that in our lives and it serves as a good, a good productive thing for us. In fact, to me, it seems like, especially you need to get a little anxious, especially when you have something big that you're preparing for. Like if you're doing a talk or you have something due, you kind of need a little bit of anxiety to get you going. Like it's like the fire under your... Absolutely. <laughs> you, you know, know? And these are, what's really kind of stunning to me, I mean, these are old principles in psychology. It's not like this is something new that we haven't managed to communicate. It's something old that somehow never got translated. We've for a long time talked about the importance of a bit of anxiety in terms of improving performance, that you actually don't want to be very, very relaxed before a big talk or before a big sports event. Like you want a little juice, you want a little rest. And what's so striking to me, I was talking uh, earlier today with a fellow clinician, you know, the kinds of principles I'm putting forward in here, these are well established, you know, very long standing, fully understood beliefs in psychology that somehow became divorced from 
where the popular culture is now, which is the sense that all anxiety is troublesome and all stress is pathological, and we need to get rid of both. And, you know, given that you can't and given that you really even shouldn't, we run the risk now of raising a generation that is stressed about being stressed and anxious about being anxious, which mm -hmm. is a really dangerous place to be given that stress and anxiety are part of being conscious, getting out of bed. Like if you get out of bed, these are going to happen. So right. no one should be walking around so scared of them. Yes, absolutely. So your book is divided. You talk about kind of girls in different areas of their lives and how, how like stress and anxiety manifest and what adults can do to kind of help alleviate some of it or help them acknowledge it and understand it better. So I think that you're really your first thing that you're teaching parents in this book is just to reframe how they talk about it with their girls and how they think about it. To me, that was the message I got is that just that's one way to ease the anxiety is to normalize it and explain that even as adults, we have it too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I would say, I mean, you perfectly described my book. The first chapter is, hey guys, we can all relax about this. You know, here's how this actually operates. Here's, you know, years of science on this. You don't need to be so frightened about it. And then the remaining chapters say, okay, let's take each slice of a girl's life and talk about when she's going to get stressed and when she's going to get anxious and how we can react most usefully to her. That was my aim in writing the book, was both to offer reassurance and then practical strategies for managing the stress and anxiety that will invariably come up. Yeah, and it, for some reason, I mean, I think because you have daughters and you've worked with so many girls, I feel like you hit on every topic that comes up that we get, that everybody gets anxious about in these different areas. So, um, so I, I talked to you ahead of time and I just said, there's no way we can cover the depth of your book. People really need to get a copy of the book and read it themselves because there will be different uh, sections of the different chapters that will resonate more with them based on their own daughter and their experience with her. But let's just go over a few of the things that just maybe a couple high level tips that you have and that you cover in the book, starting with like what we can do at home to sure. just alleviate a little bit of the, the stress and anxiety for our girls. So this is a funny thing. When parents' instincts work best is when we have toddlers. And the metaphor that always comes to mind for me is, you know, when our toddler, son or daughter, falls down and scrapes their knee, you know, what always happens is at first your child looks at their knee and then they look at your face. And usually our instincts are you know, just dead on in these moments. Usually, even if we're freaking out inside, we say, oh, you're okay, you're okay, we'll get you inside, we'll get you cleaned up. And, you know, getting that reaction, kids usually are very calm and, you know, hold it together quite nicely. Because we know that if we did the other thing, if we, you know, panic, if we look stricken, they will then become very, very frightened. You know, that they are reading our reaction for a sense of how upset they themselves should be. We need to sort of hold on to that instinct later into childhood and then into adolescence for when our child has something else go wrong. You know, when they bomb a test and they become upset or they get in a fight with a friend and they become upset. So much of how that interaction will unfold comes down to how we react. So our job is to just be that parent with a toddler, right, with a scraped knee and both validate like that stinks. Yep, I see. You've got a really bloody knee. You know, so we're not denying that there's an injury. We're not denying that something went wrong. But then to sort of hold on to our sense of, but this is in the range of what is utterly manageable, right? So maybe it's utterly manageable. I'm going to help you manage it. Maybe if I'm relaxed, you'll find your way to managing it. Um, another thing I talk about is that sometimes, especially, you know, for girls after around 12 or 13, usually it's at height around 12 or 13, they will have full-blown meltdowns, you know, emotional meltdowns where they're just sobbing and beside themselves. And one of the things I talk through is for us to remember that most feelings will run their course. And I use the metaphor of a glitter jar and I won't spoil it, but it really is a great metaphor for thinking about, you know, things getting very stirred up and then things calming down. And if parents can have confidence that their daughter's feelings will sort of run their course. You know, when it comes to hard feelings, the only way out is through. Mm -hmm. But once kids get through them, usually they actually feel quite a bit better. That confidence translates to the teenager who can see that we're not upset, that they're upset, that we can tolerate them being upset. And it also creates space for the feelings to die down by themselves. And then from there, my experience invariably is that either the 
teenager or the child can figure out what they want to do about the problem, or they feel like there's no longer even a problem, like they're just ready to move forward. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what I am hoping parents will take from that part of the book is that, you know, they have a lot of power and a lot of say and can make things go quite a bit more smoothly for their daughter, even under difficult conditions, if they can both validate but not overreact at the same time. Mm, oh my gosh. I feel like this is exactly what I tell parents when I'm talking to them about homesickness at camp yeah. or the different things. It's the same idea. Kids do. They turn around and they look at you like, what do you think? Do you think I can do this? Yes. And if you, if they see back from you, yeah, you can do this. They feel so much better because they really do. They're so linked to us as parents. I also find at camp, sometimes kids will do more, kind of get, they'll push themselves a little more outside their comfort zone because their parents not right there with them. And it's an interesting thing. I think also just having these like counselors who are expressing confidence in them or other adults. I'm sure you serve in that role for some of the girls at Laurel where they come to you or they're nervous about something and you can kind of give them that little boost as not a parent, but an outside person who knows them and can just say, you can do this. You know, I think, gosh, so much of the time, that's what we need as adults too. Just someone to just, when we're doubting or feeling a little worried, someone who says, yeah, this is hard and you can do it, you know? Absolutely. You know, it's funny. I think about how often a girl will come to me maybe at Laurel and she's maybe supporting a friend who's really struggling and feeling pretty worn down by it or, you know, having a hard time with somebody. And it's even sometimes it's just simple as saying like, that sounds so incredibly hard and you're just being so good to her. And, you know, let's make sure you're taking good care of yourself. You know, it's like, like it looks on the surface like such a minor solution that I'm offering. And yet, just the recognition of this is a hard time and I'm so impressed by how you're handling it seems to be 99% of the time what exactly what the girl needed. She doesn't need me to fix it. Oh, oh my gosh. And I, I mean, I know as a parent, I, it's so easy to just jump in with all of our wisdom and advice because, oh, we went through this or we know what they should be doing, but you're right. It just never works. They need to come to it on their own. And I, I mean, I'm always focused on what's the end goal. The end goal is for our kids to be able to like live as a functioning adult on their separate own, from us. <laughs> separate from us and not to need to ask us about how to handle every little thing. So I, I often, that's my go-to thing is just, Ooh, that sounds really hard or that stinks or, and that's yep. a really good first response to anything. And it actually, now that I think about it, it covers some of what you cover in the other chapters. Just if we're looking at the overview, even with social things, sometimes just the reassurance that, you know what, that's really, really stinks. And that kind of happens a lot with girls. Yeah, it you know? does. So let's talk about that. Just we have a couple more minutes. Why don't you just share? I guess one of the things that I would love for you to cover, because it really resonates with me, is your whole idea of realizing that for our girls, often it's much better to just have, you know, one or two really good friends and that this huge social group thing is problematic and probably not something that we need to really be, you know, pushing so much for our girls. Absolutely. You know, I think the idea, like we all, I think in theory would like for our kid to be popular, but I think in practice, it's not always so great. Um, you know, and the idea of popular is that they have a, you know, a lot of connections and a big social network. And it really is well-meaning for us to want this. But what I say in the book is, look, numbers bring drama. There's always going to be drama if there's larger numbers. And the reason for this, it's not because kids aren't wonderful. It's because, you know, there's no point in life um, when five people who are in a group could like one another simultaneously, you know, like equally. Like, you, mm -hmm. you know, like you would never, there's no possibility of getting five adults together who like each other equally. And yet, you know, younger, like seventh graders think they're going to try to pull this off. And, and invariably, when you have, say, a group of five, you know, middle school or even high school kids, you know, what happens is within that group, there will be very predictable forms of drama. There will be, um, you know, a couple of kids who don't really like each other, you know, they're kind of oil and water with each other. And so then the remaining members of the group are kind of dealt, you know, left mediating or having to sort of pick sides or, you know, having to navigate this tension. Another thing that happens is that in those larger groups, there's always subgroups who really enjoy being together and they don't always want to invite everybody. You know, so then, of course, they get together. And then, of course, because they're eighth graders, they post it on Instagram so everybody knows they got together, right? And then, and then drama ensues, you know. So 
we do. We see from the research, I've seen it a million times, you know, the happiest girls have one or two good friends. Mm -hmm. and, and our job as adults is to help them feel better about that because they do feel marginal. You know, they look mm -hmm. at these larger groups and feel like mm -hmm. somehow they're not cool. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be doing the work all the time to say, you know what, you got this, you got this unlock. You know, there, I, I know it looks maybe cool to have those larger groups, but believe me, you know, you got to just write the way you are. Sure. I think also as a parent, I feel like as, especially as moms, because we are women and we were girls and had our friends when we were in high school and college, I think we can also give them the long view. I know with my daughters, I would often say, you know, it's so wonderful that you have these friends and a few years from now when, you know, when you're in college and you're not in high school with them anymore, um, probably not all of them will be as close. And in, it's funny, my youngest daughter, especially, we had a lot of conversations. She had a really nice very quite large group of friends and they did do a lot of things together but even now you know we're I guess it's three years out from high school and it's whittled down to the ones and she you know it's it's normal you're not going to stay super close and super connected with 10 girlfriends from high school right. you're just probably no and it, there's not enough time in the day and like you said there weren't not all of them were these super equal, great relationships. So now it's, you know, you sustain those strong ones. And I think that's a lesson for, for adults too. It's, it's weird to me. And I know, you know, at camp, we sometimes get into this thing where, you know, adults who really want their child to be friend with a certain child because of their friendship as adults or kind of pushing their kids into things. And I think, was it in your book or something else? I think it was, oh, no, it was your book talking about these two different daughters in the same family. Yeah. How even in your with your own kids, they're going to be very different. Some of them are those very gregarious, outgoing kind of life of the party, love to be around a lot of people. And others are really happy with their one or two great friends. And often, in my experience, the kids who are really great with one or two friends and have deeper connections are happier. Yeah, I think so, that's right. I think that's exactly right. There's not so much to juggle, you know, not so much craziness to juggle. And I think so. Anyway, I thought that was really helpful. There's so much else in this chapter that that people need to read about just all the things that we're talking about a lot about sleep and social media and social comparison. But I want to get to some of your other stuff. So we're going to I'm going to let people read those sections of your book. I found it very interesting, your chapter about girls among boys. And of course, I was reading it as the mother of currently two teenage boys, too. Like I have my daughters and I have boys and just all the things that have been going on and the things that you've been able to talk with girls about. And I'd like you to just address one of your big thoughts, which is about how we kind of train or raise our girls, how we teach them about speaking up for themselves, but how sometimes we go a little too far in like expecting them to do things that we wouldn't even do as adults? Yeah, no, it's interesting. I would say that a, a thread that runs through the whole book is for me to kind of grapple with really well-meaning guidance that adults give that in my experience does not actually work all that well for girls. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I think um, one of them, and I know this is sort of gets into controversial territory, but I, I, I really have to hold myself to the standard of, you know, if, it, if it's not working for the girls, then it's not working, is, you know, our guidance around how they negotiate um, what they do and don't want to do in romantic settings, you know, when, when things get physical. And our guidance for girls, and again, so well-meaning has been to say, you know, just, just be very clear with your no, you know, be very, very clear with your no. And the guidance, the, well, the well-meaning aspect of it is, of course, you know, a lot of times when things go really badly, you know, say there's a question of whether or not something really untoward happened, you know, if it ends up in court, for example, you know, the, a lot of times that will pivot on, on how clear the girl was in her no. Mm -hmm. you know, and so I think that that informs our, our advice that, you know, if you're, if you're um, not wanting to do something like, you know, don't, don't in any way you know, be murky about it as far as we're concerned. So it's super well-meaning. Here's the problem. It's extremely unusual in any interaction for people to deliver uh, an unvarnished no, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. no, if, you, if you said, Lisa, do you want to come over to my dinner party? I wouldn't say no. <laughs> um, that we have actually very well established refusal patterns. Every culture mm -hmm. does. And, and the refusal pattern in our culture is that um, I might say something like, oh, you know, and actually there is, it's a very clear pattern. Like, oh, thank you so much for inviting me. Usually it starts with a thank you. And then actually the first thing I do is I pause. This mm -hmm. is interesting. If you're refusing, the first thing you do is pause. And then when we look at the research on this, you already know I'm going to say no. 
but the pause alone. So pause, and then I thank you. Oh, that's so kind of you to invite me. Darn it, you know. Unfortunately, we have plans, right? So it's pause, thank you, excuse, and then you say something nice, like, but I really appreciate you thinking of me. Like, mm -hmm. that's the pattern. That's how we mm -hmm. turn things down. Mm -hmm. And when we don't operate in that pattern, it's seen as rude, mm -hmm. right? That's just how it works. So what's interesting to me, when we think about girls, maybe in a pretty charged physical moment where their partner wants to do something and they don't want to do it, we have to be mindful that there's a couple scenarios that are highly likely that make it very, very hard for girls to follow our advice. So one of those scenarios is they actually really like the person. They just don't want to do what that person wants to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in some ways, like, we would hope this is the situation. Right, right. They, right. they care for the person. They don't want to hurt the person's feelings. And realistically, you know, if the partner is like, let's do this, and she says no, right, or no, um, that may actually really be very damaging to the relationship. And she may not want to damage the relationship. Mm -hmm. Another situation, and this one's much more worrisome, is that she's actually frightened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the people I quote in, in the book is this phenomenal feminist linguist named Deborah Cameron who's looked into this. And she says, you know, and I, I won't have it exactly, but something like, you know, Given that a flat no is generally taken in our culture as sort of a rude or aggressive maneuver, why are we advising it to girls mm -hmm. who may themselves already be in frightening situations? Like, why are we encouraging them to antagonize, you know, a potential um, threat? Mm -hmm. And so what I ask us to do is just sort of revisit all of this, you know, and to talk in real terms with girls about the realities and the contexts in which they find themselves. And to make it clear, you know, there are a lot of ways to give an unequivocal no besides just saying no, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. to really practice with them. You know, they can't be vague. I, I, I agree with that totally. Right. To really practice with them, you know, the ways or to articulate for them the ways in which they could say, hey, you know, I'm having a really good time and I'm so enjoying this. I don't want to do that, mm -hmm. but... I'm really enjoying this or, but are you available tomorrow? I'd love to hang out. You know, like that, that is all much more in line with what a girl may actually do. Um, mm -hmm. And in frightening situations, often people use excuses and they use them well. Mm -hmm. And that that is a graceful way to end something that feels like it may be out of control. Mm -hmm. And so you know, my aim in sort of thinking this through, like, or the thing that inspired me to think this through when I write about this is that both in my own practice and I was talking with a colleague, we kept being confronted by these girls in our care who had found themselves in exactly those situations. Either they liked the guy or they were nervous and they went through with sex they didn't want to have because they didn't feel like they knew how to not mm -hmm. get out of it mm -hmm. in a way that was actually practical in the real context. Yeah. Well, this made me like reading this because I do, you know, at camp, we get a chance to work with a lot of just like our junior counselors, our teenagers, and we end up, you know, they talk to their counselors and really want advice on things. And I started thinking about how this could be a really good place to role play, you know, mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. and with boys too. I actually want boys to be kind yes. of like, comfortable too. Like I, you know, as the, as a parent of teenage boys, I thought, oh my gosh. So now like, you know, if you're in a romantic setting, does the boy have to say, may I kiss you now? Like, it seems like maybe that would happen, but that even seems a little bit awkward. That's not how it was when we were in high school, you know? Well, um, and what I say in the book is, you know, if your daughter happens to be making out with somebody who gains consent every step of the way, like, okay, but we have to equip her for other possibilities, mm -hmm. which are probably more likely. Right, right. And I also like, you talked a lot about just the word consent and I had not thought about it, but I agree. It's very, it's like a legalistic term and you really promote something that's much better, which is like teaching our girls, like we want them to have these positive, wonderful, beautiful 
romantic relationships. And you're not going to have that if you're doing a legal transaction. <laughs> like, you know, it's yeah. like, it's like, you're going to be, you want to be having like a conversation. You want to know the person really well. You want to have someone who respects your boundaries. You need to be able to feel like you can say, Hey, you know what? I really like you so much. And I don't feel like doing this right now or whatever, you know, it's like just, and I feel like that's really would be important to bring this new language in and just help our girls with those words. And you do provide that in the book. So I think it could be really helpful for parents just to see that it's like you said, it's not realistic to expect that in every situation, our, our daughters are going to be able to just stand up and yell no, or, you know, I don't know that kind of thing. So I really thought that was very helpful. Well, thank you. And, and on the consent thing, you know, of course there should be consent, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like that is, that's like, yes, yes, yes. But what is worrisome to me is like that is the lowest possible bar, right? right. And unfortunately, right. We're, that's what we're often focusing on in our right. conversations with teens. Right. And so, you know, of course you should not pursue something with somebody who's not consenting, but to acquire consent alone should not be adequate, right? Because right. unfortunately, sometimes the takeaway is if you badger someone into saying yes, then you're okay, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've done that. And so I really, you know, I, I suggest like, instead of saying, you know, like you're, you're looking for consent, no, you're looking for enthusiastic agreement here, right? I mean, yes. this, is, this is romantic yes. activity. Yes. You know, this isn't a root canal. Like you, you right. get a consent for a root canal, <laughs> but you right. don't, like if somebody's saying, yeah, okay, fine. And you go ahead something is really going wrong. Right. I like, I wrote that down as a note. Enthusiastic agreement is what we want our daughters to be feeling yeah. before they're doing something and our sons. And, and I have to say, you, you talk about that both ways. It really can go like, you know, either any, any which way with partners, <laughs> you know, that it really yeah. should be both people who, you know, have in this enthusiastic agreement. So I really like the way you approach that. It was sort of a new thing because we're in a time right now where just, gosh, the conversation is so heated. And there are so many awful stories coming out about girls who have been, you know, uh, sexually exploited in different situations at college and, you know, by all kinds of things. And it, so it's really, you do want to arm your daughter with like, what, you know, how do you stand up for yourself? And at the same time, be realistic that, like you said, a lot of times it's going to be someone they like, you know, yeah. so you don't want to, you know, come across as being awful or mean or anything like that. Well, um, we are getting low on time and I have about 20 other things that I would love to talk to you about, including, I just think you're the whole, the whole chapter about boys and talking about it is really good. And then every parent of a high school girl needs to read the chapter five girls at school, especially if you happen to have one of those girls who's a super high achiever, because so much of this resonated with me. And I think a lot of our girls just, wow, the pressure they're putting on themselves is extreme. And we need to serve as that buffer that says, you know what, you don't have to work that hard in every single thing. Yep. Yep. And yep. I, I felt like I, I particularly, I won't, won't call out, but I, I know of girl very well, put it that way, who the overwork thing was always the case. It was like all A's all the time and too much studying, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, I am on a tear about how inefficient Good. girls are. Yes. But more than that, I'm on a tear about how adults stand by and do nothing about it. Right. right? That how common it is that girls are doing, you know, extra credit in classes where they already have A's and nobody is stopping them and saying, wait, 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 like, talk to me about this. Like, what are you uh -huh. doing here? Uh-huh. Well, because, yeah, those kids will always do everything. They you will. Extra credit. Oh, sure. I'm going to do that. They just keep, they'll, you know, they'll do it all. And, and unfortunately, we stand around and go, oh, the girls are such amazing students, and why can't the boys be more like them? And, you know, the reality is the boys, you know, sometimes they're not doing what they should be, but they're way more tactical about school than girls are. Mm -hmm. And our job as adults is to help girls to become tactical about school because, you know, they're very inefficient. Often they do more than is, needs to be done by a lot. And that may be sustainable in the seventh grade and maybe even the eighth, um, maybe even the ninth. But I care for way too many junior girls who are crushed by the weight of their own mm. inefficient strategies once they've got a couple APs or three or four APs and all of the other demands of junior year. So this is something we have to really disrupt earlier in girls' educations and to not, not so much necessarily denigrate 
the kind of, you know, seeing what I can get away with quality that sometimes boys bring to school and also stop celebrating the overdoing it that so uh, often girls do at school. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You, you call that moving from grind to tactician. And yep. this really resonated with me because honestly, having my two teenage boys who approach school very differently than my girls did. And mm-hmm. I was one of those parents that was like, why can't they just be more, you know, why can't they care that things look nicer? You know, that their right. handwriting is nicer. Why can't they? Meanwhile, both of my boys' grades are fine. Yes. And, yes. and yes. they do, they have been tacticians. They do what they need to do. Yep. To do fine. And I, and you, I read that of yours and I was like, oh my gosh, I am completely guilty of that where I, because my, because my girls are my older ones, I had only ever experienced girls who take so much pride in, you know, every little spelling test and every yep. little thing. And, you know, you talk about the flashcards and making too many of them and too many notes. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this was me as a child, first of all, and this was my girls. And I now see that in terms of well-being and in terms of life, I mean, you, you know, as adults, we can tend to overwork as well and not prioritize. Like, you know, you, sometimes you have to, you get to a point like in your job where you've got to go, okay, well, I cannot do everything to this right. such a high level of perfection. And nor do I need to. No. Right. But, yeah. But many women, I think, still are doing that. Oh, absolutely. And I think the other thing, and, and I just don't want to say this, you know, that sometimes parents have said to me, well, this is how I did school, you know, mm-hmm. the way she's doing school. And here's the thing we have to keep in mind. Our most ambitious students at this point are taking an average of eight APs in high school. This was not even on the table when we were in high school. That those kind that that wasn't even available to us, much less expected. Right. And so the problem is like, okay, that that may have been how you did school. This isn't even sustainable now for what school has become for a lot of students. And that the boys who look like they're phoning it in or you know doing the minimum, they may actually have figured out, you know, especially the ones who figured out how to get the grades they want or the mastery they need, they may have figured out the system by which school today makes sense. Mm-hmm. I mean, absolutely. And to be honest, if you're not that interested in a subject, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to pour your heart and soul into it. You might as well just get by and then focus yep. on the ones that you really are good at in terms of strengths and what we know about where you spend your time and focus should be more on things that you actually enjoy and are better at. So why are, you know, why force yourself to do things that you don't want to do? Okay. Last question, because I know I could talk to you forever because I love everything that you have to say, but I want to hear you mentioned in Untangled several times, you, you mentioned summer camp, and then I saw it a couple times in Under Pressure too. Tell me your thoughts about how you think summer camp benefits girls. Oh, I could go on forever and ever. I think it is so good for girls to be in new settings. And of course, especially in settings where the technology goes away to let their hair down, to get to explore sides of themselves that may not come up in their day-to-day at home, to learn about new aspects of their own social abilities because they are not, they're with kids who they may or may not know. They get to try out different aspects of themselves. Whenever I'm taking care of a kid who needs sort of a social reboot, I'll say, any chance this kiddo can go to camp this summer? You know, that I feel like, you know, I've watched kids who are really struggling socially come back to school after a summer at camp and just have a whole new repertoire of skills that they never could have developed if they'd stayed in their exact same social track with their friends at school. But then the other thing, this, I don't know if this is how it goes for all kids, but I, I send my own two daughters to summer camp and uh, my older daughter, my, my younger daughter is going for the first time this year, but my older daughter, we live in Ohio and I grew up in Colorado and she goes out to camp in Colorado and through the entire school year, she maintains a text, a group text message with her cabin mates Mm. and they support each other all year and they use that as a place to sort of vent about what's happening you know Mm -hmm. which is so safe because they don't know they're not you know talking about kids that nobody knows they did a secret santa for each other they had one of they had one of the little sisters assign everybody the secret santa by text Mm -hmm. Um, and they mailed each other christmas gifts Uh. and so even without being in the same time zone Camp has provided to my older daughter a secondary social network that she uses all year. Mm, oh and I just gosh. think it's the coolest yeah. thing ever. That's amazing. Okay, what camp does she go to? I'm dying She goes to, to Geneva Glen. Oh, I know it well. Oh my gosh. I went through the uh, certified camp director training in the 1990s with Ken 
from there. And they're yeah. not, I think they've retired, but oh my gosh, that's amazing. Well, you know what? I, you just made my heart so happy talking about that. And your daughter's story is happens countless times. The friends at camp become these very deep friendships and can provide a very nice support for girls yeah. during these difficult years. So I love that your daughter has had that experience because I know many girls for whom their camp friends are their kind of their lifeline yep. during difficult times because it is a group that they were, you know, dirty in the mud with, have seen them wake up in the morning, have seen them be scared before doing an activity, have talked through their, you know, secrets and dreams. And it's just a really amazing chance at camp to step back from the grind of school and all the sports and all that and just be, you know, with yep. people. So I'm so appreciative that you're also a camp person. <laughs> Absolutely. I believe. <laughs> That's so great. Well, Lisa, I can't even thank you enough for taking the time during this busy season to be on my podcast. I love your work. I will continue shouting from the rooftops that everyone who has a daughter needs to read both of your books now, Untangled and Under Pressure, because they are not difficult to read. They are, I'm sure, are they going to be audiobooks too for people who They're don't They're both really read? audiobooks, yeah. Great, great. Yeah. Because I would also just recommend parents who don't like to pick up a book, just get the audiobook and listen because so much great information and just little simple tips of just little tweaks in the way we respond to things that can just really help alleviate some of the anxiety and stress and make it manageable for our girls. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, this has been great. I'm so inspired by Lisa DeMore's writing, speaking, and work, and I really enjoyed our conversation. I hope you did as well. I highly recommend you pick up a copy of her book, Under Pressure, Confronting the Epidemic of Stress and Anxiety in Girls. And I'd like to leave you with one passage from her book that I highlighted. This is one among many highlights that I have in her book. Much of what our girls learn about how to manage stress comes from observing how we manage it as parents. Our daughters watch us for cues about how alarmed they should be by life's difficulties. When we let our own inner chicken little take over and panic in the face of manageable challenges, we set a bad example. When we accept that stress often leads to growth and help our girls do the same, we create a self-fulfilling prophecy for ourselves and for our daughters. This passage and much of Lisa's book reminds me of one of my favorite parenting quotes. Your children will become who you are, so be who you want them to be. I'd love to invite you to join me for my camp director interview series that I'm calling Happy Campers Interviews that are starting up in January. And I'll be talking to camp directors from day and resident camps from around the United States. And we're going to be talking about how their programs promote life changing social and emotional growth and the lasting benefits that kids get from coming to different camp programs. This podcast is a proud member of Parents on Demand, a network of high-quality shows for families just like yours. Download our free network app on Apple and Android and listen to your favorite episodes on the go.